The following program is rated M for a mature audience. It contains coarse language and sexual references. Welcome to Hungry Beast. Tonight, our theme is download from digital drugs and a real life Facebook to people who download the old fashioned way. You know, when somebody's got their pants down, they're not really worried about emotional baggage that might get in the way or being judged. But first. Last week, Google announced new copyright violation policies for ordinary YouTube users. Offenders will have to attend copyright school and then pass a test before they can go back to uploading. Google might be getting uptight, but Microsoft is loosening up a bit. Its open source policy has led to a flurry of inventions based around the Xbox Kinect gaming console. People are using their Kinect to work on Minority Report style interfaces, optical camouflage and visual recognition tools to help the blind navigate on their own. Music and film companies make a lot of noise about the threat presented by downloaders. Well, we've got some good news for them. Download may soon be a thing of the past. A few months ago, I went to a dinner party in New York. It was organised on Facebook. I got the invite via Gmail, I RSVP by Twitter and I confirmed by text. I checked into the party using location app Foursquare. The party itself was streaming anime from movie site Netflix and a painfully hipster soundtrack was coming from music site Pandora. Seven different tech companies came together to make this party happen and most of them delivered their services over mobile phone, a machine that has the storage and power of a personal computer from a time when Paul Keating was king of Australia. How can something so small and weak be so powerful? That's a question I get asked all the time. Well, by outsourcing. Most of this phone's computing power is done somewhere else. It's a place that Microsoft ads and nerds call the cloud. It sounds ethereal, magical, white and fluffy, but in reality, the cloud is made up of massive warehouses filled with computer servers. And despite the name, they're very much on the ground. All the videos on YouTube, the pokes on Facebook, the sheep in Farmville, the Google Docs, the, the Hotmail love letters, they're all stored here. All your software, your docs and your projects can now be stored on big corporate server farms and streamed directly to your computer whenever you ask for it. Remember when you used to go down to the store to rent a bit of shiny plastic that you used to put into a machine that used lasers? <laughs> oh yeah, good times. Well, downloading basically killed off the CD and now it's choking the life out of the DVD as well. Worldwide, sales are tanking and they're predicted to come to an end in 2013. <laughs> Last year, Blockbuster, the biggest video rental chain in the United States, closed down, though its Australian namesake limps on. But Download hasn't done this on its own, and it now faces a competitor in streaming media. Video on demand sites such as Netflix, Amazon and Hulu, all of which come directly from the cloud, now offer Americans inexpensive or free streams of films, music and TV. Even Facebook has started streaming feature films for $3. And then there's the rise of streaming television, internet connected TVs and set top boxes that pull digital content from the net and pop it on your big screen. Think Apple's iTV, the Google Box, the Boxy Box, Channel 7 are actually going to launch one, the Fifi Box Box. It's a little confusing to set up, but once it's going, <laughs> it's good for a laugh. In Australia, ABC's iView is the most successful. It's a direct carbon copy of the BBC iPlayer, which is so good that in the UK, commercial networks want to use it too. And that gives us a pretty good glimpse of IPTV, the next model for television, where networks will just stream content directly from the cloud, doing away with TV as we know it. For media companies, they found out that the internet actually, rather than being a bad thing is actually a great thing for them in terms of being able to protect their content and being able to monetize their content on a consistent basis. You look at Korea, massive IPTV uptake, they're the leaders. You look at America with the, you know, the data and bandwidth rates are so cheap and so plentiful. Americans don't even think about what their monthly 
data limit is. Streaming is changing music too. iTunes, once the unstoppable digital download music store, is having its market share eaten away by cloud-based streaming services like Pandora and Last.fm, SoundCloud and more recently, Amazon's Cloud Player. All of these let you browse their libraries and listen to music instantly. It's a bit like customizable radio. Gone is all that downloading. In fact, having personal collections of MP3s? Please! That's so 2010. Apple has even built its very own giant data centre spanning 46,000 square metres in North Carolina. The rumour is, is that they'll be launching their very own cloud music service in September. So that's it. We live our digital lives in the cloud, which is made up of big computers that connects to our tiny devices that brings us the internet, movies, music and TV. Oh, but don't worry about your collection of shiny, spinny discs. There's bound to be another way you can use them. Stuff said. Download. Sir or madam, youth or maid, would you kindly forward the enclosed letter and earn the blessing of a poor British soldier on his way to the front? Private Thomas Hughes, in a message in a bottle, dropped into the English Channel on September 9, 1914. Discovered 85 years later in the River Thames, the letter addressed to Hughes' wife, Elizabeth, was delivered to their 87-year-old daughter, Emily, in New Zealand. There's not a lot of cursing or swearing, not a lot of the put-downs one would expect to find. A 1993 Canadian Broadcasting Commission news report, thought to be the first ever on the World Wide Web, talking about online interaction. I don't have interest in it. I'm so busy smoking cigarettes, eating food and doing illegal drugs, I don't have time for it. San Francisco woman Krejna Kuma's view on the internet, quoted in local paper Central City Extra, March 2011. Yeah, well, we met online, didn't we, honey? Yeah, 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 we did. His profile said he was tall, dark, and handsome. And when I met him, I thought, wow, he's got a great sense of humour. And yours said you were 16? Yeah. yeah. I even sent you a photo of my niece and said it was me. Yeah, you said it was you. When is your niece coming around again? eEmpathy.com, bringing freaks like you together. This is Hungry Beast Download Edition. There are many things the internet can do for you, but can you download digital drugs that'll get you high? Mark Fennell finds out. <laughs> These are just a few of the hilarious slash disturbing lo-fi homemade videos you get when you type the word iDosing into YouTube. Apparently iDoses are downloadable digital drugs and they give you a completely legal, non-chemical high. The idea is they come in the form of audio files, you plug in, you press play, and if this evidence is anything to go by, you should get the mother of all cum faces. There are websites all over the internet that claim to give you eye doses that replicate the effects of real drugs like marijuana, peyote, etc. Technically, listening to an unpleasant noise is not actually against the law, unless you count the laws of common sense. Thankfully, the ABC have advised us that common sense law is unenforceable. So, we've decided to do a little experiment. With your hard-earned tax dollars, we have bought marijuana, cocaine and, just to kick it old school, some opium. Now, believe it or not, there may be some genuine scientific basis to these digital drugs. Idosing is built on an audio technique called binaural beats, which has actually been around since 1839. The idea is two sounds are played simultaneously, one in each of your ears, at a slightly different frequency, and they cancel almost all of each other out, leaving a third imaginary beating noise. Now, apparently, you can use this technique to lead the brain into various different states. Your brain waves operate on different frequencies, ranging from the high-functioning gamma waves right down to the deep meditative theta waves. And when I encounter a binaural beat, my brain waves are supposed to move into that theta state, and it's here where all the trippy effects should kick in. Alpha-theta brainwave training has been reported to bump endorphin levels and even create false memories. And this is what digital drugs sound like. Mm, okay, so that was marijuana, which was possibly the most bored I've ever been in my life. 
kind of more woozy and discombobulating than high. And there was kind of a weird tingling thing that ran through it as well. Cocaine. Sounds like Vangelis. That was really unpleasant, actually. Uh, I could not wait to get out of that. It, it does make you quite fidgety, which is kind of consistent with, uh, with cocaine. Opium gave me the worst headache. It feels like a tight, sharp thing that kind of goes from about here up to here. Why is it so bright in here? So there's definitely an effect, but was anything actually going on in my brain? Certainly in terms of your alpha, which is your mm. awareness pattern, there was no change. Oh. We restaged the experiment in the neurology department of Macquarie University. The ability of the brain to react to different stimuli is uh, infinite. Would it be reasonable to assume that this is a placebo effect that I, I had? Yeah. And yet iDosing still whips up controversy. Websites are luring kids with free downloads of so-called digital drugs. It could lead to illegal drug use. The sensationalist coverage isn't surprising. Downloadable drugs give you this three-for-one fear deal. You've got fear of technology, fear of what teenagers get up to, and the good old-fashioned fear of drugs. It's the perfect triple threat. As for the perfect high, not quite. Apple, the world's biggest tech company. Market value, 222 billion US dollars. Think different, it urged us in its ads, aligning itself with Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Its famous I'm a Mac campaign sneered at its rival, the PC, prioritising the human over the corporate, the casual over the suit. Great pitch, but not always easy to deliver. Last year, 10 Chinese workers suicided by jumping from the buildings of Apple's hardware contractor, Foxconn. Following a visit from Apple, Foxconn, which also services its competitors, said it would introduce counselling, cut the maximum work week to 60 hours, and string nets between buildings to catch jumpers. Another contractor, Taiwanese manufacturer Wintech, made headlines in 2009 when 137 workers got sick because of a chemical in hexane. Apple says all workers were cured, but some claim their health is still deteriorating and that Apple and Wintech won't pay for follow-up treatment. In truth, most of the gadgets we buy are built on outsourced labour and questionable pay rates. Apple may be no more guilty than its peers, but its peers didn't co-opt Gandhi. It was calculated last year that if iPads were built by American workers, they would retail for $14,970. Apple is also copying flack because the iTunes store won't allow apps that make direct donations to charities. Apple CEO Steve Jobs scrapped all corporate philanthropy in 1997, calling it a temporary cost-cutting measure. He has yet to reopen that division. Last month, Jobs was ordered by a US judge to answer questions in a class action accusing Apple of an iTunes music monopoly iTunes takes 30% on everything sold through its store. Music, movies, TV shows and apps. In February, it announced it will now take a cut on subscriptions sold through apps. Companies selling newspapers, magazines, video and music streams will have to hand over 30% of every sale. That market power has also allowed Apple to freeze Adobe's Flash video out of its devices, even though Flash is the closest the net has to a video standard. Apple. Its products are elegant and user-friendly, but its corporate culture seems less think different and more think like everyone else. Um, we met on eEmpathy yesterday. We got so bored of playing Kiss Chasey, walking up to strangers in the playground and pulling their hair, sexting. After a while, you really just want to settle down and change your relationship status for someone. From now on, we're it's in a relationship. It's complicated. What? Oh. EEmpathy.com. Why wait till you're legal for romance?
Downloading isn't just digital. People have always needed to get stuff off their chests. Traditionally, it's been the role of counsellors or priests to listen, but there are others we go to, perhaps without realising it, to talk about what's going on in our lives. Good morning, six minutes after five o'clock. Uh, the first thing I would do... Would We're just having a bit of a I've chat. three main points I want to raise. Would euthanasia be um, a I viable option? What surprises me is when people are prepared to tell me about things of a very personal nature. After they went into Iraq, I think... I remember that... when Iraq first happened, we had a Vietnam vet call in to tell us that his son was going to be going to Iraq and he was in tears. He was upset because he knew what his son was going to be going through and he was frightened for his son. I think he probably felt that he had informed people but at the same time he'd got something off his chest, let some of that emotion out uh, and this was a place that he could do that. I can see somebody sit down in my chair and just say a simple thing like, how are you? And that person can just be overwhelmed with emotion. I wouldn't think a lot of people would think about a hairdresser as someone that is a witness to a lot of detail that happens in people's lives. As a sex worker, it surprises me how open people are, but I guess when somebody's got their pants down, they're not really worried about being judged. Sex can actually take up like a really small amount of time, so it may just be 10 minutes out of an hour. But for the majority of clients, there's actually a need to spend some time doing other things, like connecting with um, another person in a very intimate way. But there's also a lot of people's emotional baggage. A lot of the time, I'm dealing with that sort of stuff. If you're a tradie out there, we want your opinion on this. And also, if you've had some... Trade... People that call in can range from truck drivers through to people who are up breastfeeding in the middle of the night, people who can't sleep, people who are elderly, or who may have had strokes, who perhaps aren't listened to. Some people are really lonely, and this is their only chance to speak to people at all. It's always amazing. The day can start with a client telling you, oh my God, I'm pregnant, I'm so excited. And your next client's coming in and telling you, oh my God, I've just had my fifth IVF cycle fail. Their confusion over their job, the death of a parent, a relationship breakdown. People talk to me about absolutely everything. You can see it in their faces, like how relieved some people can be. And that tension may not always be sexual. It, it can be quite emotional or it can run deeper than that. It could just be the one hour of their week where they didn't feel like they were being judged. If I've had clients tell me that they're having affairs, I would see both clients. So you're holding a piece of information from one client who has given you that information knowing that you see their partner and I guess wondering what you're going to do with it. I made a decision a long time ago not to share information. Hi Trevor. Hi, <laughs> Trev, how are you? We're well. Quite often what happens is we'll start a topic and it will take us away to somewhere else. Uh, we were talking uh, about anniversaries and a young woman called in whose son had died when he was two. And it was a significant anniversary for her. And it's hard to listen to people in such pain. And she felt lonely and she felt isolated. And this was a contact point for her to be able to, to talk and to relate. The delightful thing that happens then is that listeners will call in and say that she has support from the listening audience, that there are people out there that care. Yeah, the top is that you probably want to It's been a pleasure talking to you on the program this morning. You know, we're supposed to be healthy, happy people, but you know, stuff goes wrong in our lives partners die, people come out after years of being married. Society actually doesn't teach a lot of people how to deal with that kind of stuff. If we don't have the ability to share and experience each other's lives, then we live in isolation and I think that's pretty much not meant to be. That was my original plan. I think we need to get stuff off our chest so that we don't have to deal with it. I don't know whether communities have those places very much anymore. And maybe Talkback Radio is a place that they can do that, they can say what they feel.
The need to be able to emotionally connect with someone in a really, really close and intimate and honest way, in a naked way, um, is still quite apparent, no matter how, you know, many members of friends on Facebook you have. I live a fast-paced lifestyle. Work, gym, friends. It can be hard to meet women. My job keeps me time poor. It's hard to find the right person to settle down and have an extramarital affair with. And then we found e-empathy. And now I have something to do in my lunch breaks. And I have someone to do in mine. eEmpathy.com. Find someone just as awful as you are. Social media websites like Facebook ask for all kinds of personal information and most of us just hand it over without thinking. We tell websites things we would never tell a stranger. Or would we? Do you mind if we ask you a few questions? Just, just you a couple sure? of questions. One in three Australians can't be wrong. She must be a MySpace user. First of all, uh, what's your name, address and phone number? That has to be personal. <laughs> I don't know when I want to give all that, to be honest with you. Don't worry, we're just going to show it to about 600 million people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll probably pass, thanks. My email address is that at live.com. Great, uh, can you just you... confirm that? Yeah, confirm your email address, please. Um, yeah, that again. I just want to know what your, uh, your, your interests are, where you went to school, your sexual orientation, gender. What are you doing right now? Um, I'm drinking Coke. Angus is currently drinking a Coke. Can you guys give us a list of every friend you've ever had? Uh, in alphabetical order, please. Alphabetical order would be, yeah. would be great. So starting with A, obviously. Do you know any errands? They generally come first. Yeah. So I put pornography under your interest then? Well, I think I yeah, should. Yeah, Pornography. Definitely. Tag that. Tag that. Tag that. Do you guys have any photos of yourselves in your underpants, semi-naked, <laughs> duck face? No. Would you be willing to take some? No. Would you mind getting really shit-faced to make a total ass of yourself so we can show all of your friends and co-workers? Everyone say, never going to get promoted. We're just no, going to ask really, you about no, your, really your, your sexual orientation, gender, your interests. Are you a male or a female? Good. What are you doing right now? Fuck off. Well, welcome <laughs> okay. to the offline social network. Enjoy that. Enjoy that. Update it regularly. I'm leaving. Would you, could, you, could you give us a reason why you're leaving, please? Sorry. Are you not finding this useful? Uh, is it a privacy concern? Other? Before you go, can you please read out what it says on this sign? Pretty much every computer attached to the internet has a unique signature, a number called an IP address. Your IP tells websites and companies where you're from, allowing them to screen visitors. That's why your computer won't let you watch videos on US TV websites and why your friend in America can't watch Hungry Beast on ABC iView. It also explains how overseas sites show you local ads and why torrent sites always promise hot singles in your area. There is, however, a simple way to become anonymous online, a piece of software that is cheap and completely legal. It's called a VPN and it works like this. When you use it, your internet browsing is routed through servers based in a handful of countries around the world. And it's these servers that provide a proxy IP address. So, to the sites you're visiting, you appear to come not from Australia, but from somewhere local. Maybe not down the street, but definitely not the other side of the world. Some companies offer VPN services for free, but these are often unreliable. Subscription-based VPNs are widely available and cost around $30 a year. Many also offer high-end encryption, handy for doing things like internet banking from your phone, emailing sensitive documents, and anything else you just think is your business. Ow! Who would have thought three letters could get Big Brother off your back? And I need you to come and stand on this spot here. Hey mate, how are you? What grade are you in? I use the internet to play games, uh, to learn about things, read books, and do some maths on it. If you go on Google, you can go on dictionaries. There's some stuff that kids, um, that's not, not appropriate for kids, and some that is. You go on Google and type something on Mozilla Firefox. I'm not allowed to go onto YouTube, but I go onto video hits, and I just, um, I, I only listen to one song on it. What? What the hell? It's not rude or anything. I chat on Club Penguin and this other game called Mushy Monsters. Sometimes to my friends I just email them for no reason and I just say, how are you today? If they get my attention, maybe I would get on my website. That, that's it. <laughs> 
Facebook that I think it's not good for children. Yeah, he has to be 13. But heaps, I lie about it. Heaps of people lie about it. Because mm. my mum says that it's way too dangerous and I've heard lots of stories about dangerous things. I uh, have 407 friends. My mum spends most um, about only in the morning and sometimes afternoon. My mum uses it a lot. I think she uses it every day. She plays this game and she never goes on anything else. All she does is play the game of Cityville, something like that. If you use internet too much, um, you, you'll get tired. Gosh, she's addicted to that game. I know, she loves it. She loves making cities and building on it. <laughs> Your eyes will burn. Mate, it's been really nice talking to you. It's been very funny. Well done. All right, we're Thank finished. You. you get to go back to class now. Follow the money. 300,000 US dollars. The price of a gigabyte of storage in 1981. 10 US dollars, the price of a gigabyte in 2000. 10 US cents, the price of a gigabyte in 2010. 2,760,000 US dollars. The amount the US military agreed to pay Intrepid Corporation to create automated online personas which will promote American interests on Middle Eastern blogs and social networks. One billion dollars. The estimated amount Australians gamble online every year. 30% of people over 16 have gambled online. That's Hungry Beast, finished and ready to be downloaded. As always, you can keep up with us during the week on our website and Facebook and Twitter. Next week on Hungry Beast, we put perfection under the knife. The perfect body, the perfect animal and the imperfect vegetable. Good, Good night. night. The most common is the German cockroach. If one German female moves into your home, you could have 100,000 more within a year. Every year, animated characters bring us closer to having perfect digital humans. If you look at these faces long enough, you realise that they look nothing like humans at all, and more like heavily Botox zombies. Definition of perfect? It's a really hard question, but I'd probably have to say my back. Uh, my chest. My stomach. 